uh, early last year, a uh, senior editor came uh, to me and said, uh, uh, we need you to write about cyber war. And I said to my senior editor, oh, that's a great idea, boss, but we really don't want to do that. Uh, and I said that because, uh, in my experience, uh, only a fraction of us have uh, a grasp of what cyberspace is. And if you start talking about this vague thing called cyber war, uh, it wouldn't make any sense. It would seem sensational and not be grounded. And so uh, my boss agreed, and we started a, a year-plus-long uh, kind of adventure or quest to come to an understanding about cyberspace and what cyberspace is, and then to find stories that would help, uh, as I like to tell people, my mom and dad and Congress to understand uh, <laughs> what cyberspace is so that we could come to grips with it. And seriously, how can we possibly come up with solutions if we don't know what the problem is? And so uh, what I wanted to do tonight is share with you some of what I've learned, uh, which I find uh, is endlessly fascinating, uh, it's uh, stupefyingly complex, but uh, we'll, we'll take a few steps forward in it tonight and I'll share what I know. And the thing that I'm looking forward to most is hearing your thoughts and questions uh, when we have a segment at the end. Uh, the digital universe came to life on October 29th, 1969, when researchers at UCLA sent a single message to the Stanford Research Institute. It wasn't much of a message, just one word, log in. In fact, only the first two letters made it through before the system crashed, <laughs> but those two letters ignited a technological and communications revolution. In the coming years, as networks spread and computer power exploded, hundreds of millions of people found their way online. And then an idea that began as science fiction in a book called Neuromancer became a reality, cyberspace. Now, cyberspace is the co most complex man-made environment on Earth. It expands every moment, warping notions of time and space and diminishing the, the differences between machines and people. Everybody in here who uses the internet is part of cyberspace. The electronic impulses that carry the data online move at lightning speed. A round trip from Washington to Beijing occurs online in less time than it takes for a major league fastball to cross home plate. Blink and you miss it. The internet alone has grown from thousands of people in the 1980s to more than two billion people now. There were almost 800 million smartphone users around the world at the end of 2011. Each of those devices is part of cyberspace. An uncounted number and variety of devices have been linked into cyberspace, offering almost magical features and services, smartphones, industrial control computers, railroads, satellites, jet fighters, the new cars that you, some of you own, laptops, data routers, medical equipment, elevators, video cameras, ATMs, toll booths, and GPS systems. The list grows by the hour. A researcher at Cisco estimates that more than 12 billion devices have been connected so far. 12 billion devices, in addition to all the people, are now connected to cyberspace. And that number will more than quadruple over the next decade. I talked to David, Dr. David Clark, who is a senior researcher at science at MIT. He helped to develop the architecture of the internet in the 1970s. He and his colleagues then had no idea what was coming. Here's a quote uh, that he shared with me. People say to me, did you imagine hooking every computer in the world together? And I said, oh yes, we thought there might be 10,000. <laughs> wow. And guess what? Because there were so few computers that they anticipated coming online, security was never a priority when they built the internet. Hacking has always been a problem as a result. But last year, something changed. The world became aware of cyberspace and cybersecurity 
and the implications. It seems as though everyone, our president, lawmakers, corporate executives, and regular people like us, began acknowledging that the threats in cyberspace were unprecedented, unrelenting, and possibly existential. That means, of course, the power grids going down and communications networks being wiped out. Attacks on computers and networks now occur every hour of every day. Espionage of military communications, theft of money and intellectual property, disruption of water service and nuclear processing facilities, invasion of privacy, and yet, because it is often impossible to know who's behind a hack or where it originates, or even when it has occurred, the best that defenders can do is react quickly and well. Resilience, not prevention, became a mantra in 2012. This is really fresh stuff. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said in October, last October, the most defensive, uh, destructive scenarios involve cyber actors launching several attacks on our critical infrastructure, the power grid and such, at one time in combination with a physical attack on our country. Attackers could also seek to disable or de degrade military systems and communications networks. The collective result of these kind of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor. Now we have at the National Security Agency, reputedly the most secure digitally computing, digital computing environment in the world, an example of one of the most insidious kinds of cyber attacks or hacks. It's called the insider attack. Edward Snowden's stunning breach of security may seem like a simple act of theft until you contemplate that he was able to roam freely among the nation's most important secrets, largely undeterred by cyber defenses. A panel of the nation's top scientists told the Pentagon not too long ago the cyber universe, this is a quote, is complex. These are the top scientists. They were gathered together. Groups called Jason, by the way. It's really, really cool. I'm going to start over on this. They got together, and there in their report, they said, quote, the cyber universe is complex well beyond anyone's understanding and exhibits behavior that no one predicted and sometimes cannot be explained well. For more than a year, as I started, started at the beginning, I decided to do my best and explain what we could. My goal was simple and old-fashioned, to help regular people, lawmakers, and others better understand this critical aspect of our fast-changing world. It turns out the cybersecurity problem we face has its roots not only in technology, but in economics, psychology, and yes, money. Perhaps the single best summation of the problem came from former CIA director George Tenet. And here's what he said. I love this because it's so unsettling. We have built our future upon a capability that we have not learned how to protect. Right? We communicate with each other. We do business online. We have our national security secrets. We have business entertainment, all our personal secrets and we haven't learned how to protect it. Because I want you all to think about, very carefully about this, I'm gonna say it again. We have built our future upon a capability that we've not learned how to protect. All of cyberspace is driven at the most fundamental level by computer code. Ones and zeros, ones and zeros, in trillions of combinations. It's the simplest of man-made creations, right? One and a zero, it's an impulse. The number of lines of code in a personal computer's operating system has grown from about a million lines in the early 1990s to 80 million or more in some cases now. These are the computers that we use. A million in the 90s, which was a big deal, to 80 million now. Software the instructions that tell the computers and code what to do have brought unimagined benefits. But sadly, so software makers cut corners. They bowed to economic forces and rushed inexact or buggy products into the market. And because of the world's accelerating dependence on their products, 
That means products, uh, problems. That guarantees problems. At last count, there were more than 53,000 different vulnerabilities in software systems that can be exploited to take control of the computers in your homes and in your businesses and in the schools. Many of them have never been patched. But there are also an uh, uncounted number of unidentified vulnerabilities. These are other. This isn't the 53,000 that are known as zero days. That's the name that I took for our series. A zero day is a flaw in a software program. Software, of course, tells your computer what to do. These flaws allow an intruder to get into the system and take control of it, but the maker of the software doesn't know about them. Only the hacker does. And thus, they, they've dubbed them zero days. Zero days are really, really scary for businesses and for national security because how do you know what to defend against if you don't know what the flaw is? And by the way, there's a market in zero days, and our government buys them for uh, purposes that they won't, they won't uh, disclose. We know why they buy them. They buy them to break into computer systems abroad and spy, but they're not going to talk about that. In the rush to take advantage of networks, an uncounted number at the same time that we have these zero days, we have an uncounted number of power generators, oil rigs, security systems, and other parts of the world's critical infrastructure that have been connected to the internet. And guess what? Many of these systems are virtually unprotected, less than your home computers. They're unprotected from hackers. And by the way, I, I talk to the hackers. I've seen the evidence. Um, I've written about it. And as a result of the hackers' work and me writing about it, things have been changed. So I know for a fact that this is real. In March 2012, General Keith Alexander, head of Cyber Command, blamed China for the theft of an astounding amounts of intellectual property. Now, what we're talking about here are the plans for future jet fighters. Uh, they're the plans for battleships. They're the, it's um, new drugs, discoveries that have taken years of research. It's all there, and the hackers have gotten it. Google was hacked, and their operating system was taken. Did you guys know that? Google was hacked, and their operating system was taken. We believe it was the Chinese, but who knows? Uh, when Alexander was talking to Congress about these problems, he said, and this was last year, we reserve the right to use all necessary means, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, as appropriate and consistent with applicable laws, Alexander said. We, they've updated that now, and they've more or less said, um, we reserve the right to break into computer systems abroad, and if it's merited, we're going to uh, destroy or degrade those systems. And we know from last week, uh, General Alexander uh, affirmed, confirmed that they're training hundreds of cyber warriors right now, and they'll be standing them up um, in the next uh, year or so. Um, we've had them. Uh, I've talked to at least one of these, or a couple of these cyber warriors. But it's now a part of our military. It's a part of our life. And uh, these teams will be very active going forward. Battles in cyberspace are increasingly considered uh, an inevitability uh, year to year. In fact, the number of corporate, criminal, and military struggles already underway seems to be rising and rising quickly. Zero day attacks are just one of the methods. One of those came in 2009, those attacks. And not only did they target the same group, target Google, they targeted Northrop Grumman, Dow Chem Chemical, and hundreds of other firms in one sweeping, ongoing set of attacks. Hackers from China took advantage of a flaw in Microsoft's Internet Explorer browser and used it to penetrate the targeted systems. Over several months, the hackers siphoned off an ocean of data. Another attack uh, came last year. It took aim at cybersecurity giant RSA, which protects most of the Fortune 500 companies. That vulnerability involved Microsoft Excel, a spreadsheet program, uh, and the outcome was the same, a zero-day exploit, that's an exploit that nobody knew about beforehand, was used 
to enable the hackers to infiltrate RSA computers. And by the way, I want to repeat, RSA provides security, computer security. It was hacked. The hackers got into RSA system and, um, and then used it to infiltrate other companies. Everything is connected, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about another, in fact, I'll talk about it now. Social engineering is the manipulation of people to break into systems. It's the attack of choice by the hardest core hackers in the world now. And it comes in a form that everybody in this room is familiar with. Uh, Dear Jane, sorry I missed you at the party. Here's a link to the pictures. Click on the link, the hackers own you, and it's over. And Jane might not even be the target. That link that she clicked on immediately downloads a small bit of code it opens a pathway back to the hackers. They take control of her computer and infect it. It may be Jane's husband or her friend who works at a bank or a military facility. When she writes to them, she infects their computers. Their computers then com go back to what's called command and control computers or servers. And the hackers then have a pathway in there. And by the way, human beings are the living, breathing component of cyberspace that is probably the most vulnerable to hacking of any. And I can't tell you how afraid the NSA, the CIA, all of corporate America are of social engineering because uh, it's a lot easier to use them to hack into a system than it is to find a zero day and use that. The most sensational zero day attack became public in the summer of 2010. Some of you have probably heard about it. It occurred at Iran's nuclear processing facility in Natanz, and it's known as Stuxnet. And that attack involved a worm and four zero days that uh, the United States and Israel worked on together. And it, it wormed its way into the nuclear processing facilities, and it told these centrifuges to spin out of control and destroy themselves while at the same time telling the human monitors everything is fine. So they spun out of control, they destroyed themselves, and the idea was to delay Iran's nuclear processing. Um, and it sounds like science fiction. I mean, that stuff's hard to believe, but they did it, and uh, it had the ramifications, and it destroyed uh, the physical machines uh, in Natanz. By the way, one of the things that the Stuxnet attack did was to infect uh, what we call thumb drives or media. Has anybody ever used a thumb drive? You plug it into your computer. It's kind of scary thinking of it now because those things are another attack vector of choice. Infect that, plug it into a machine, and the game is over. Uh, the hackers like to say, I've pwned you. Uh, and it's a lot worse than it sounds. You've probably heard of other intrusions. Uh, Think about all the intrusions that you've never heard about, and it really starts to get creepy. I'll just give you some general areas that we know are infected. We're not even sure who's infected them, but they have theories. I'll start with our national labs. They're infected. Uh, our power grid computers, they know that there are hackers that have put code in there that's just sitting there and waiting. Defense contractors our top secret military network known as CIPRANET. All of these places have been infected. Cyberspace is more than interconnected computers. It's people and all their glorious, complex needs, desires, and motivations interacting with computers, machines, and one another. Think of that. I mean, hell, our families are complex enough. Can you imagine two billion people working together with computers and trying to figure out where an attack is coming from, it's impossible. That's what makes the dynamic of the environment so uh, interesting and complex. Another complexity is how something known as white hat hackers, and they're the good guys that are trying to identify problems, how they identify vulnerabilities and learn to share information about them. Well, the white hat hackers figure out how to break into a system at, let's say, a corporation. And they do it for the corporation. They find the vulnerabilities. They tell the corporation. They use whatever techniques hackers use. And then the corporation that's hired them can plug those holes. 
The interesting thing is that the white hat hackers publicly share their techniques. All those tools are available to you right now online. You could go online and find these tools that are incredibly powerful. Some of them, if you have some technical skills, essentially involve hitting enter, clicking on a box, hitting enter, and it'll launch an attack. And it's legal because people in the government realize that we need white hat hackers to try to keep up with the black hat hackers. But guess what? The black hat hackers, the really bad guys, all over the world are reading the stuff that the white hat hackers are putting out. Metasploit, just take that word. I won't even bother going into detail. Metasploit is a toolkit that's got a thousand ways of attacking. And white hat hackers contribute to it constantly. And it's all what we call open source. It's available. And that Metasploit is only one toolkit of many out there that enable that white hat hackers to do their job to improve security. But of course, the black hat hackers use them as well. I think it's really interesting to cite a dusty literary analogy. Um, it's really an Alice in Wonderland world where nothing is ever what it seems to be. And the implications of even good deeds are never very clear. Consider a teenage programmer uh, named John Matherly. More than a decade ago, he asked a question. It's a perfectly natural question. How much could he learn about the devices that were being connected to the internet? This guy's a teenager. He's from Switzerland. He lives in California now. Now he's in his 20s. But he asked that question. And so he decided, like a hacker, good hacker, and he tinkered with code to ask the internet questions. Matherly eventually developed a way to map and capture the specifications of everything from desktop computers to network printers to web servers. That was at the beginning. And he called his system Shodan. And he took the name, by the way, from a video game. And I won't even tell you the character, you know, the Shodan character, but it, it's ridiculous uh, unless you're a hacker and a young person. But he called it Shodan, and he asked his friends to try it out. So a group of like-minded hackers took Shodan in 2009 just a few years ago. And they suddenly realized in no time at all that they were revealing an astonishing fact. Just a few years ago, they found uncounted numbers of industrial com control computers. These are the computers that run power generators, let's say, or a water plant, were linked to the internet. And some of them had zero security, none whatsoever. You could literally go in and look at the control panels and change things. Water level up, water level down. Power generator on, power generating going too fast and maybe exploding or something. Uh, the Shodan users found and accessed the cyclotron at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, emergency room equipment in hospitals, and thousands of unsecured Cisco routers. And those are the computer systems that direct data throughout the internet. So over the past two years, Shodan has gathered data, this is a cool number, on 100 million devices, recording the exact locations and the software systems that run them. Matherly wants the white hat hackers to use them to fill the gaps, to, to fix things. Once again, Guess who has access to Shodan online? It's wide open. The bad guys. I just think it's, uh, it's a fascinating world where simple fixes are, are not going to work. Consider another system called Metasploit. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, but the bottom line with Metasploit and these other tools and Shodan is that they're part of an escalating arms race in cyberspace. It's happening. It's real. Most of us will never see the evidence of it except indirectly. But there's an arms race in cyberspace, and it's spiraling up so fast. And it's going to be a part of the national security budgets. It's going to be a part of every corporation in America. It's amazing. Shoe companies, t-shirt manufacturers, banks, all of these folks are having to spend money and think seriously about cybersecurity in part 
because all of your information is in their computers now because you buy things from them or you keep your money in their banks. There's a question that you might ask, simple question, why aren't such systems outlawed? And the answer is the good guys have lobbied hard to protect their access. They argue the reason is simple. They need every tool they can possibly get at this time of transition to find the vulnerabilities and stop them before the bad guys can. And yet, because the bad guys can get them, in some ways it's, it's a dire situation. Now there are an endless variety of things here to address. I want to save some time to hear and discuss your thoughts, as I said at the beginning. Everyone in this room has something to contribute. Cyberspace is not for them. It's not for the tech guys. It's not just for the policymakers. All of us have to think about this and make choices. It doesn't mean we have to make instant, come up with instant solutions. It doesn't mean that we're going to be taken over the coals by hackers immediately. But this is truly one of the great issues of our time. And uh, we should all think about it, I would say, and share our thoughts with one another and with Congress and you know, uh, demand that uh, they get serious about this because uh, they're not. Congress is not serious about this. And a lot of lawmakers don't have the faintest idea of the stakes and the complexity of it. I'd like to share one more thought before we uh, have a conversation and, and uh, discuss some of your questions. The solution to cybersecurity must involve a closer scrutiny of information networks and you. It's going to have to involve flows of data that include your flows of data, surveillance. Security systems will, by definition, have to look into every corner of this vast and growing enterprise or environment called cyberspace to make it secure. And that's going to be. Uh, that's going to include the flow of email, the flow of data, the behavior of corporate employees, the spooks hired to work at the NSA. This is an inevitability. This kind of surveillance is happening, and it's going to happen. And I would argue that you're not going to get security without some of this happening. But it creates a choice for each of you and for our country as a whole. Do we allow that cybersecurity surveillance system to grow unfettered because it's easier than typing up? And because we don't really write code, we don't really fully understand it, should we just leave it to them to do the surveillance and trust them? That means ceding authority to people who operate in the world of secrets, oftentimes with little accountability. We're going to give them the power to make the choices. or do you, do we, push for the far more difficult approach, which is striking a balance between surveillance and civil liberties, between the aggregation of power, which surveillance creates, and the constitutional checks on power that we really have come to ex ex expect as Americans. Our system is built, as we all know, on checks and balances. To me, the answer is obvious. We, as a country, work hard. We take whatever time it, it takes. We spend whatever money is necessary to ensure that we strike the balance between security and the, ne the necessary surveillance and our individual liberties and civil liberties in general. It's a hard task, but I would argue it's the right thing. But I'm not at all sure that that's what our country will do. I would love to hear uh, any questions and any thoughts uh, from you um, now. Sure. Um, shall I uh, talk about the chart while we're getting set up, Bob? Does everybody have this? There will not be a quiz. Yeah, Bob points out there's no quizzes. I might point to one or two of you. All right, so, so this, this is simple, cartoonish illustration that I created oh, sheesh, 10 years ago, seven years ago, um, for some colleagues that were asking me, why is privacy important? What is this data stuff? And I did this on the literally a kind of a back of the envelope 
legal pad, something or another. And let me explain what it is, because I, I really feel like it captures a lot. 1973, Privacy Act, Congress deals with the Privacy Act. They were, con they were con concerned, as some of you might recall, with data banks. Remember the term data banks? Data banks were growing. Um, right around 1973, you might recall that there were huge civil liberty violations. There's domestic spying. Um, there were lists being kept of the enemies of the government. Uh, it was a terrible time. And Congress, in its remarkable wisdom, came up with the Privacy Act to create protections for us. I picked that day for that, that reason. The, this is you, each one of you. It's non-gender specific, sort of. These dot, the person's going that way. This is the data trail that you left behind then. See that? Those dots represent the mortgage in your house, which is on paper in a file, your DMV record, which is on paper in a file, your birth certificate, that, uh, the car you drove, uh, uh, your neighbors uh, were in phone books, right? Couldn't get that electronically then. Your neighbors and, and your kids, your school records, all that stuff. That's the data that you left behind in 1973. Now, what's changed? Well, we talked at the beginning about the explosion of cyberspace and computing power, right? From then till then, this is now the data that you leave behind. And without belaboring it, uh, does anybody here use email? Who goes online to buy things? Uh, what about Google? Who looks at Google? Uh, does anybody post uh, photographs to grandma and grandpa or vice versa, to the grandkids? All the photo sharing, all the stuff that you do, the books you buy online, the Kindles and all that stuff, these dots represent each one of those transactions. Now, what's happening now that is maybe as important as the total number of dots, the dots represent, each dot represents an email, right, a purchase, credit card transaction. You all get that, right? What's more important, if you can see it, are there, see those little colored dots in 2013? Think of lines connecting those color dots. And those color dots and the lines connecting them are the product of something called algorithms. And there's some people in here that know algorithms. But it's a model or a computer code that has learned from looking at tons, trillions and trillions of pieces of data that uh, it's not all the data that matters. It's only key kinds of data. It's whether you buy diapers and beer at midnight at Target on a Friday, you know, or something like that that says, okay, this is the new family, you know, they're aspirational, the Target is in a certain neighborhood, so they probably have income, et cetera. But it's the profiling, okay, that matters because the marketers and the security people want to get in here. They want to get in your head and they want to be able to make predictions about whether you're profitable and you're not. We don't care about you. We care about you. You're going to get better treatment. Or if you're a risk because of your friends and associates and your pattern, but you're not, you're going to get, you're going to get in and you're not. Where are you going to get into? Job, a government job, uh, maybe it's certain types of information. It, by definition, and I know this because I've talked with these people, the idea is to discriminate, and it's a generic word, it's to make choices based on the data. All right, so now we're in 2013. We know this is happening. The, the data is being aggregated. Hundreds of millions, trillions of records, and the computer models, the algorithms, are being refined because the, the machines, in fact, are learning. They're churning through the data over and over and over again. Has anybody, just raise your hand if you've ever gotten a call that said, Mr. slash Mrs. Smith, there's a strange purchase that's occurring in Alpharetta, Georgia. Who's done it? Please, quickly, raise hand. All right, thank you. All right, so now we all share this experience. Guess what? Those colored dots looked at with an algorithm are telling them things about you they're making predictions, and they're calling you. And by the way, sometimes they're right. And there's going to be benefits from those. But 
I want you to understand, regardless of what you hear, they want to get in your head and they want to know as much as you know about yourself or more in order to make predictions for security and to make money. By the way, we get benefits. We get security in many cases or in some cases, and we get lots of benefits. We all, I get benefits with my iPhone. I, I get to use it. They, I get benefits with the predictions they make about books. These are simple things, but they want to get real deep into it. Okay, so now we're done with 2013. Onward to the future. This is my prediction. I made this stuff up based on my learn, so just take it with a grain of salt. But all right, everybody has this? Everybody looking at that? The pixels of the dots are so fine of the amount of data they're collecting out in the future that it's black, okay? It's dense black. And I'll give you some benign examples. Please raise your hand if you drive a car with a GPS system in it. Please raise your hand. We'll just do a couple of these to get the point. If you have a smartphone, please raise your hand if you've ever, uh, if you buy things from more than five places online. Just, okay, right? So, all right, everything you're doing is creating torrents of data that are being collected. And by the way, I have a phrase that I developed. It's, it never quite got to the point of being poetic, but nevertheless, data is forever. The data is never, ever going away. And why is that? Here's the cost of computing in 1973. Say so it's right there, okay? Every, some of you guys had like 78. I bet there's some people in here who had those first Apple computers, right? How cool is that? This guy's an engineer here. Look at him nodding. I was there. <laughs> cost of computing, as he knows, was right here. And still, it was beneficial because it not only helped him do uh, the physics problems and so on that he was working on, he did his personal finances and all this sort of stuff. From then, in the late 70s and the 80s, the cost of computing is below, the, it's down, it's all the way on the floor. And so it's so cheap to maintain storage, it's probably, I would bet, cheaper than killing the data. So it's there. All right, so now we're in the future, all this data is being collected. It's about the fridge. Has anybody heard about how they're going to have microchips in the frid refrigerator so that they, the fridge can tell you uh, that stuff is going bad? Forget how it smells. The com <laughs> the, no, but seriously, it's going to tell you, uh, you're, it's going to help you maximize how you get around town because right now there's already a company in New York that collects location data on all our phones. I'm not making that up. It collects trillions of pings. Are, are, there are cell towers here that are getting all our location devices over and over every 20 seconds or so. And it collects all of that. And you can go and look real time as people move around Adams Morgan in Washington, for example. And they will provide a service to marketers to best market to those flows of people going in and out of places. And they say that it's anonymized. but I bet there's somebody here who's already figured out, just based on what I said, how to de-anonymize that. And guess how it is? You take the phone where it sits from 9.30 to 7 in the morning, and you can pretty much predict on most cases that's where the person lives. Then you just go look up the address with the GPS coordinates, and you're there, right? See, now you know who it is. But nevertheless, all of this stuff is all of that data. And my prediction is that the algorithms are going to be so important that they're going to be doing predictive analysis. If anybody's seen a wonderful science fiction movie, in science fiction, but Minority Report, where they do pre-crime and they predict what somebody's going to do. Will it be that advanced? Probably not. But they're going to be doing predictions about you. And there will be decisions made about you and how you experience the world through the internet, on your television, as you go through jobs in life, there are going to be decisions that are made about you based on this information and these algorithms. Um, and that's why I think this is important. Because for all those benefits, and to be sure they're there, it means that we're going to allow the corporations that are doing this and the government that work with the corporation to make these choices about us. And we're not even going to understand what it is that they know about us. And I find that troubling. I would like to have nice boundaries. So 
that's it. That's my little lecture about the chart. And I did it to just try to help explain why this stuff is important. There uh, are people going around uh, with questions. If you have them, please put them on paper, hand them to our volunteers who will bring them over and then pass them up. Um, this may be a little spooky, but a telephone okay. has been found. Uh, <laughs> it is a Blackberry uh, and is in the back. It's in the back um, if more than 10 people claim that we're in trouble. Um, but if it is yours, please do claim it. Let me start with one question in addition to thanking you, Bob. Um, regarding vulnerabilities in every computer, uh, you paint a very, very bad picture. Uh, is there anything that us average guys, average users, can do to protect ourselves and our data that is existing now and you know, do you have a list of what are the 10 most important steps we should take? Well, I'd like to be clear here. W w did I not describe it well? Is that why I painted a bad picture? Or... <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, sure, there is a, uh, 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 there's a guy in here, I'm not gonna point him out, but he is hardcore security guy who's moved into your community. And, and, uh, and he uh, will probably agree that for us, the simplest, best thing you can do is don't open an attachment or a link that someone sends you unless you know for sure who it is. Now, I call myself, I don't know if this is true, but I dealt with this privacy stuff. Uh, I wrote a book, as you know, for several years ago. And people would say, what, initially when I got onto it, people say, oh yeah, that and the black helicopter is right, Bob. And they treated me as though I was paranoid. I, like to describe myself as the least paranoid person in Washington. And recently, because this stuff has become so acute, I called someone that I've been working with to ask if they sent me an attachment because it was sent without any note to it because you just never know. And by the way, the Washington Post was infiltrated by hackers along with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And uh, this is serious stuff. Do not Click on a link, regardless of it's its mom, it's the grandkid, it's the best friend next door, unless you're sure that the PDF, the spreadsheet, the cute photograph of the kittens or the link is coming from them. Don't do it. Because if you do, the hackers are going to get you. And in some cases, they're garden variety, uh, you know, Eastern European criminals. Uh, but they might be Chinese hackers who are trying to find their way upstream to something uh, even more pressing. That's the main thing, and I'll leave it with that. Oh, I'm sorry. Public service announcement, because I keep hearing it over. Have your, uh, patch your, your computer, update your software. Um, I think that has some limited effects, but it definitely helps update your software and your virus detection and all that. You mentioned Snowden before. Um, you know, how is it that a 29-year-old high school dropout can get the kind of security clearance he had? What kind of, how much damage can he really do? And you know, he sort of disclosed himself. So another part of it is how efficient are we at finding the black hats? The Snowden represents something, as I mentioned in passing, called the insider threat. And a lot of people won't want to call it a hack. But if you think of it, it's the perfect hack, right? What do, ch what do hackers want to do? They want to get inside a system and then roam around and take control. Well, if you're already in an organization, you have access to these troves of data. That's a hack. Uh, the idea, and you're probably hearing this from me first. I've been pounding the drum on this. The idea that this occurred at the NSA is probably one of the greatest breaches of our lifetime, national security breaches. I, it, it's, a, it's, a stunning, it's a stunning breach. It's very unsettling to me. And it happened, I believe, and I have not done the reporting on this, but I think logically, as a consequence of 
this need to share, connect the dots, culture that prevailed after 9-11 in what I think is pretty clear a willy-nilly way. We're going to share, we're going to connect the dots, and at the same time, they dropped the security uh, procedures, compartmentalization, because it was inefficient, it was hard, and I believe that's the only explanation. And the other question is, uh, how could he get in? Uh, that's a whole other subject that is worth time in uh, a venue like this, uh, which is um, the rise of federal contracting. And how, I'll just uh, as an aside, point out that one of the great issues in my mind of our time is how our government has outsourced fundamental functions to the private sector uh, with very little oversight. I sat uh, two years ago for a series of stories that I did. Has anybody heard about Alaska Native Corporations? Well, in any case, with the head of procurement at the Defense Department, the, uh, just briefly, in the 1990s, we cut the procurement workforce, which is by definition inefficient and red tape. We cut it in half to something like 130,000 people. In 2000, the outsourcing went up like that to, to private companies to support the wars and because of philosophical commitment by the government. Huge amounts of billions, hundreds of billions, go to contractors. Guess what the procurement workforce uh, growth was during that time? Something like a net eight people. So the procurement workforce stayed like that. The contracting went like that. It's a free for all. And I think that it's hard not to believe that uh, that didn't play a role here because there's so many contractors and so many with top secret clearances. My colleague, Dana Priest, wrote a series about intelligence contracting that they simply can't keep track or uh, oversee them all. And I have a feeling that that played a role here as well, but I couldn't be definitive uh, about that since I haven't uh, done my homework. There are a number of questions uh, in which we're going to be picking your brain. Okay. Such as, and I'll, let me ask them rather than all together, since I think they can have, may have shorter answers, uh, one at a time. Can a computer be hacked if it's turned off? Uh, uh, I think the answer is yes. Okay, that's scary enough, but if, uh, <laughs> is, is a Mac or a, a Apple software more secure than the other software that is Windows based? Yes. How effective are passwords? Uh, well, uh, 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 you know, Anna Lee, the granddaughter's name, or, you know, uh, you know Tiger, your cat's name, are not effective. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I thought Spock was pretty clever for a long time, and I realized <laughs> passwords can be very effective. Uh, the, there, uh, as our um, security specialist in the room, might tell us is that you want a two-factor authentication. So you want to do something besides a, a password to uh, make it doubly hard. Um, so if, there's a, if you hear that phrase or something similar, take advantage. It's inconvenient. Uh, but I suppose in some ways we all want to develop good data hygiene. We want to do the right thing. Take these steps. Can you stop it? Absolutely not. No way can you stop determined hackers. Right? But that doesn't mean that you give in. You do what you can to create a barrier that makes you less interesting than your neighbor. Let them go after your neighbor, protect yourself. No, I'm kidding. But. <laughs> one, one more of this kind, and then I have a couple of policy questions here. But can you explain what the cloud is? And is it safe? Uh, no. <laughs> The cloud, um, uh, the, the cloud is uh, our giant, giant data servers that uh, can be partitioned. So let's think of a cloud. All right, now we have a big fluffy cloud. It's three-dimensional. And it can be partitioned um, into lots of tiny spaces by security means and code so that let's say, and I'm not kidding, I find this amazing. Certain parts of the cloud have your electronic health records. 
there are electronic health records being held in the, in the cloud, medical records, and they tell me, oh, it's really safe. And I asked for our recent story, for my last story in the series, you guys can read this. I said, okay, well, where is it and how do we know? And do you know the answer this guy gave me who was selling the service for electronic health records to clinics? I don't know if they're in Steamboat, but to clinics because it was cheap. And by the way, it qualified the people that bought this service for uh, stimulus payments that were designed to stimulate the, the embrace of uh, electronic health records. I asked him, well, where is this stuff? And he, he said, well, I don't know where it is. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know where it is? He says, well, we feel confident because we have a contract with the data cloud provider that everything is fine. <laughs> wow. So the fact is, uh, my technical knowledge of the cloud is uh, very limited, but are, they're giant data servers. They partition it up. They put things in there. And um, I will say this, uh, that there are, there are very, very smart people, um, some of them at the NSA, who say that the use of the cloud, if you encrypt the data, uh, could be you know, absolutely secure. And the encryption, just so you know, for those of you who don't know it, uh, and boy, I hope I get this right, Robert O'Hara becomes you know, a jumble of uh, nonsense letters and you have a key that when you plug it back in, transforms them back to Robert O'Hara. But without that key, which can be this long or even longer, um, you can't transform Robert O'Hara back. It'll always be a jumble of nonsense characters. And because they're so good at the keys now, um, they can protect it. Medical records and electronic medical records are something which are being increasingly used and how does having them accessible uh, affect a person's job prospects, insurance, uh, and other things? Is there a risk in addition to the supposed good side of electronic medical records? They should answer that question. They just did. It's a, it's a built-in problem. We're rushing toward electronic health records before uh, uh, George Tenet said, right, we've built our future on a capability that we cannot protect. Electronic health records are massively vulnerable. My year long, year and a half long examination showed me that the most vulnerable industry in America right now to cyber hacks may be the hospitals. Wow, I couldn't believe it, but I kept testing it. No, this can't be right. I, you know, I've got to, and you can see the last story. And it, instead of telling a story with characters and stuff, I thought it was so important. We actually just come out and say, this is the most vulnerable industry. And by the way, there's good news out of that. Uh, uh, the FDA, uh, in part because of that story, just for the first time updated its cyber guidance for the manufacturers of medical devices for the first time since 2005. First time since 2005, so. The cyber command that, that I mentioned and you mentioned, how big is it? Uh, where are all of these people? Where are they trained? And um, what are their skills? And then I want to ask a question after that about uh, the Foreign Industri uh, Intelligence Surveillance Act Court. Uh, Just to give you a heads up that that's coming. Cyber Command is based at Fort Meade, uh, which they just know as the fort. And that's where the NSA is based. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's growing very, very quickly. Uh, I would argue uh, personally uh, that it's a good thing that we have a Cyber Command. Uh, what we may not have is a, and I certainly don't, is a clear understanding of the aims and limits on their behavior. And Clearly, you have to, as a country, uh, face up to reality. I'm not a believer in just because it feels good, let's, you know, let's oppose something. The reality is we're under a constant threat, our personal information, financial, national security. And we need well-trained, honorable, disciplined warriors to help protect the country. Uh, but right now, it's at such an early stage, um, 
I couldn't tell you all the details. I do know that uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of people and they're hiring uh, a lot of hackers. Next week, uh, General Alexander, uh, the head of Cyber Command and the head of the NSA, will be in Las Vegas speaking to one of the world's largest hacker conventions, <laughs> partly to recruit hackers to come work for the NSA and for Cyber Command. Alice in Wonderland, right? I'm not kidding about this. It's really interesting. Well, I've already started thinking about the lead, by the way, of that story. <laughs> Which is? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm thinking that, uh, that it, it, we'll see what happens. But the idea of General Alexander standing before all these hackers, like they're probably like dogs looking at him like he's raw meat and NSA, let's go hack. I'm thinking that it, 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 it was, it's going to be strange even by Las Vegas standards. So. <laughs> what? Much of what we have been talking about is defensive, but we know that the United States is also doing hacking and yes. um, try cyber practices, cyber warfare against China, against Iran's centrifuges. And two questions based on that is, you know, how do we or how does a global community negotiate an agreement or can we regulating that kind of offensive um, cyber warfare, and uh, will it work because many of the actors, anonymous or others, are not governmental? Uh, there are talks underway uh, involving the State Department, involving uh, military, involving corporate leaders. Uh, the uh, uh, DHS leaders are involved in talks with our allies and with uh, other countries around the world. And uh, you know, it's one of those things where, Bob, I don't see any choice but to do the diplomacy and start trying to create some framework. This stuff is super hard because of everybody's self-interest and the tender feelings that people have about their computers being broken into and all that. But uh, yes, that's underway. And one of the things uh, that's uh, interesting here is we're really at the very early stages of all this stuff. So it feels like it's fully blossomed, and we all know about privacy, and oh, all the data is being collected. We're just at the very, very beginning of all this stuff. The US um, has a court which is supposed to review what we do and what the US government does, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Is it just a rubber stamp? because it seems to have approved virtually everything that is asked of it. And if that's the case, how would you reconstitute it, or what, how would you make it uh, deal with what you said earlier, the balance between security and civil liberties? Uh, I've heard people describe uh, the problem that we face here as not only a secret court, we don't know the operations of the secret court. And they have approved virtually everything. But there are secret laws that the secret court are interpreting in secret. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll tell you, one of the driving forces of what I do is um, I'm not against secrecy. In fact, I applaud it uh, in some ways. Uh, I respect. Corporations have to do research in secret because they have to protect it. To some degree, I think that's very important. National security secrets, um, I'm not inherently against that. I think it's, you have to have that. But um, I'll be damned if I'm going to stand by and have people running our government say, trust me, on something so important when we know for a fact it involves data collection about the companies we use and leave our information with all the time. Uh, Viet Dinh who uh, was at the Justice Department, wrote the Patriot Act. He was the lead architect of the Patriot Act. And I spent a lot of time with him for No Place to Hide. And Viet is a um, Federalist Society uh, devotee. He's a member. And Federalist Society is an organization that's uh, they're, they're conservative, and they believe in a, a, a literal interpretation of the Constitution. And, but, but in any case, Viet said, and has said it on multiple occasions, but he said it to me, 
Fiat said, never trust the government. Never trust the government. Now, that's different than how some of you heard it. It doesn't mean the government is doing something bad. It means that our system is you always get the government to show what it's doing so that they can be held accountable. Because they're not above us. They are us. And they should answer to us. The FISA court, why should the FISA court be that secret? It should be secret enough to protect sources and methods and not hurt national security. But somehow, I, I'm confident that our Congress is going to um, eventually write a law that's more nuanced that may not give you, hopefully they'll give me access to some of this stuff, <laughs> but they're not going to give wide open access. But maybe there'll be a group of um, non-ideological or bipartisan group of folks that maybe don't have a vested interest who can look in on it and raise questions a little more aggressively. Um, I like to quote. Um, I like to quote Marx on something that I think is very important for all of us. Uh, Marx, as you, some of you might know, s said, um, uh, "Trust everyone, but always check the dice." That was Groucho Marx who said that. <laughs> Why do we have hackers? We, what what motivates both the white hats and the black hats, and who pays them? I'm going to take a sip of water. Uh, uh, going back, hackers hacked for two reasons. Hackers hacked because they're a breed of people, and they need that challenge. Uh, I call it a wall to push up against. That's my thing. I just find challenges and then push, get tired, and go to sleep. Uh, hackers need technical stuff. Hackers used to be motorheads, right? Some of the guys that tricked out cars. Those are hacker type mentality. The other ones is money, of course. Hackers did it for money. Here's what's really, really scary. We don't know what's motivating people uh, who are hacking now. Now we've got national security hackers. We have spies. Uh, there are certain countries that define their interest very, very differently than the United States. And they're looking for anything that might in, in pose on their interests. And we have people, and I believe there's growing numbers of them, and I'm deeply troubled by this type of folk who are unmoored from traditional set of ideologies. In fact, they'll take 10 ideology pieces of them, throw them together, mix in a little libertarianism, and, uh, and say, I know what's best for the country. Information wants to be free. And they'll break in and do things. Anonymous, I think, fits into this category in some cases. They're, they feel righteous, and they do things. But the thing that's hard is they're not driven by money. So it's going to be hard to, to predict when and where they attack. Cyber soldiers of fortune. It could be that, or they're not even for fortune. It may just be because oh. they feel good. It makes them get a buzz from doing what they're doing, or it fits into their personal philosophical framework. There was a question which dealt with power plants, but I think its implication is much broader. If there are so many problems with the internet, can't power plants or other institutions which are vulnerable get off the net and just have an internal system and then avoid the potential problems of disruption or destruction? Uh, do you remember that quote from that guy, Clark at MIT, he said, uh, yeah, we thought all the computers would be connected, all 10,000 of them. Well, he said something else that was really, really interesting. He said, we never envisioned a power plant computer being linked to the network, or a water plant, and so on. And so you've raised a very good point. And the problem is, I think some people are going to want to pull them back off the net. And that's what uh, many security people say needs to happen. The problem is if they're, let's say, for example, you have a, um, a publicly owned, stock owned power plant. Well, how are they going to explain to their stock shareholders that now everything is a lot more expensive because they have to hire new people, new technology, and not take advantage of all the efficiencies that come with, with going on the internet? So there's going to be resistance to going back to more security, which, by the way, is one of those economic forces that drives everything we've been talking about. We want the efficiencies. We want the services, the convenience, the magical kind of things that we get on our phones. But 
if you want those with security, you have to make choices. And a lot of us, I would say in our country, probably everywhere, are not always the best at making those choices and we opt for conveniences, discounts, and so on, rather than the harder, costlier, more inconvenient approach. You didn't mention Facebook or other social media, but are they uh, a data threat? How have they been misused? Um, and where are they in the pictures that you paint? Uh, it's such a big topic that it almost deserves a, a whole uh, source of study itself. Um, we expose more information on Facebook and the social media about ourselves and our children and our lifestyles and our thoughts. We give it away to almost anybody um, than ever before in human history. Including employers. A lot of it's kind of boring, frankly, but I, no, no commentary on you folks. Um, but the thing is, each one of those, I hear people say, and I cringe every time I he hear this, and please don't say it tonight, I have nothing to hide. All right, <laughs> please. It's not about privacy. This is uh, something I've been talking about for years now. It's not about privacy. Privacy is what I call a tofu word. It'll take on any flavor you want it to take on, okay? Forget privacy. It's about power. Okay, there's an organization here, boom, and here's you. If that organization has a lot of information about you, uh, much more than you've ever shared because they can buy it, dossier this long, every place you've lived, all the cars you drive, the net worth, the types of magazines, everything, they can make choices about you that have an influence on you and you don't even know it, and it's just beginning. So. The Facebook contributions that you make are valuable to all those people. And I guarantee you, they're scraping it. One of the predictions that uh, I like to make to try to scare, my, scare our children into uh, behaving sensibly online is that I haven't seen it yet, but mark my words, there are going to be companies, their whole purpose will be to create dossiers of young people looking for jobs, and if there's 10 if there's 10 people up for a job, the five or six people that are drinking the beers in high school and doing things they shouldn't be and sharing that on Facebook uh, are not going to be getting the jobs or you know, added data that is out there about them. There are going to be companies that are going to be for hire companies that will collect that and the companies you know, will say, tell me about Bob O'Hara. Is he worthy hire? And um, I would hope they would say yes, but you know, maybe based on Facebook uh, postings, they would say no. Should we do online banking? Or I, does that put us more at risk? Uh, I think online banking is actually fairly safe. I do it. Um, uh, I do it for two reasons. One, they use encryption going to and from. And two, uh, they claim they'll back, back it up if, if it gets ripped off. So, I, I, I should ha let you guys know that I don't take a lot of special precautions myself. I never put anything in email, ever, ever, that I wouldn't want to become public. And it's a good discipline anyway, because much of the stuff we want to write, we shouldn't be sending that to people. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I do take care uh, in simple ways. Um, and I think if you do these simple things, uh, you can uh, reduce the risk a little bit. The last question, I'll use, ask it exactly as it was posed. So online poker isn't safe, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> the more you bet, the safer you are. <laughs> uh, you know, when we started this, I think we were even before 1973 in terms of our understanding of what is going on. We may not quite be at 2013 yet, but thanks to you, I think we're moving in that direction in terms of our understanding of this. We recognize we're at the beginning of it. It's not going away. This is the new normal. And thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you.